15, verse 1 through 11. Let's read it in a responsive style. I'll read a verse, and you guys read a verse too. Okay. Um, some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the brothers very glad. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. He made no distinction, distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles the yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? Verse 11 together. No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. Amen. This time, Pastor Brett will give us a message entitled, Purified Hearts by Faith. It's good to be back. Um, if you don't know, I just came back from Burma. Um, I was there for about a week and a half for a mission trip. Um, and there, there's a, a group of Karen people and um, Burmese that are there that we went and we visited. Um, so for about a week, they had a summer camp. And so um, me and along with some other team members that I went there with, um, we went there and we shared the gospel with them and, and shared some messages with them. And had fellowship and forum, and it was a really good time. There were about 200 students um, that participated in it um, that are from um, from Burma, uh, and also there's some groups actually that I was able to meet um, that came from Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, and Philippines. There's quite a lot of people there actually, a lot of foreigners helping out, um, and it was a really good time, a lot of fun. Um, the, the students received a lot of grace during that time. And actually, for the first time, they were actually able to experience evangelism. So during the conference, we had a time of camp, and um, I think that was a really good blessing that they were able to receive. Um, and of course, that area we were in, um, it's, it's not very um, nice. <laughs> I mean, um, that, that area, there's a lot of hardships there. I mean, I mean of course, there's, there's no electricity. Um, you know, we, we took our, our showers in the river. Um, <laughs> really? There aren't really any toilets or anything. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. The, the, the greatest time, you know, the, the greatest thing that I realized is how delicious ice water is. <laughs> That's the one thing I crave every day, just cold water. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it was a good time um, during, during that camp. And um, the students received grace, the pastors even, they received grace. Um, and it was a wonderful time. Uh, so just, I just want to thank you for your prayers, um, for those that were praying about it. And um, just thanks again. Um, today, um, we're, today is Easter. You know, it's, it's the day where we celebrate uh, Christ's death and resurrection. Um, and this is a very important time because this is the foundation of our faith as Christians. And you know, I was trying to think, you know, how can I match the scripture that we're going through today with Easter? You know, should I just give a message about Easter, or should I try to match it with the message? <laughs> And you know, as I was praying and thinking about that, one of the things that I realized is that, you know, honestly, every single Sunday that we preach, every single Sunday that we celebrate, we celebrate Easter. Because every Sunday, what we preach about is the death of Christ, how he died for our sins, and 
his resurrection. So every Sunday is, is Easter for us. Um, so given that, um, let's, let's look at today's passage together. Um, today's passage, it begins in verse 1. It's talking about a condition that there is for salvation. It says in verse 1, Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, Unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. So this is a condition for salvation. You cannot be saved unless you follow the law of Moses, unless you're circumcised. And in verse 5, we see who it comes from. It says, Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, Then Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. So we have here is, is two groups. We have the group from Antioch, which is Gentiles, and these Pharisees, the Pharisee group that is coming and telling the Gentiles they basically have to become a Jew if they want to be saved. Yeah. They have to follow the laws of the Jews. And so this is, it's a gospel that they're preaching. It's a gospel of the law. It's not a gospel of grace. They are saying that there is salvation in Christ Jesus, but you have to be circumcised. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of Pharisees today that, that preach the same thing. You know, they tell us, you know, you're saved through Jesus Christ, but no drinking. You're saved in Jesus Christ, but no smoking. Or you're saved in Jesus Christ, but you have to follow this rule or this rule. You, know, you can always tell because they'll say, they'll emphasize Jesus is the Christ, and you're saved in Jesus Christ. But then after that, they always add this but. Because they always want to add something to the gospel. Which means the gospel is insufficient for them. They're trying to find a way that they can work it out or earn their salvation. Um, to them, the grace of God and faith are not enough. You've got to work for your salvation. The cross of Christ, and it's not enough for them. You know, they're trying to live by this written law. We don't live by the law, we live by the Spirit in Christ Jesus. And I think Jesus addresses this issue very clearly. In Matthew 16, 6 to 12, he talks about being careful of the yeast of the Pharisees. This is what he says. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And the disciples, they, they discussed this among themselves and said, it is because we didn't bring any bread? So the disciples were confused. Why is Jesus saying this? So Jesus, aware of the discussion, he asked, you of little faith, why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? He says, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And you have to be aware of this, even within the church. You know, the yeast of the Pharisees, the teachings of the Pharisees of today, they're dangerous. They're like a yeast. You have a little bit of yeast in dough, it quickly multiplies and spreads throughout the dough. And that's what happens in a lot of churches, in a lot of places. You know, it just takes a small bit, and then everyone starts adding something to the gospel. And it takes one person or one conversation, and it starts working in your thoughts until it's something that you believe in as well. Where it's not just the gospel, but there's something else. There's a condition along with that salvation. And, you know, since it's Easter during this time, um, I want to also look at a couple of things that align with Easter. Um, during the time of Jesus' death and um, the, the, the resurrection time as well, um, during that time it's Passover. It's the Passover feast that they have, and also they're going through the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Um, so looking at the Passover first, if we look at the Passover, in the Old Testament, we know what the Passover was about, right? You know, it's a, through applying the blood of the Lamb that Israel was set free from Egypt. You know, this allowed them to escape death itself and be freed from slavery, slavery to Egypt and slavery to idolatry. And so in the New Testament, we have Jesus Christ. You know, John himself says, you know, behold, the Lamb of God. Jesus is the Lamb of God. And he's also called the Passover Lamb because he allows us to escape death and have eternal life in Christ. We are freed 
from the slavery of Satan. And during that time, there's also the Feast of Unleavened Bread. These two feasts are actually connected. And in the Old Testament, they used unleavened bread because during that time, they were quickly in Egypt. So they didn't use yeast in their bread. And it was unleavened bread. And as I shared earlier, you know, this yeast signifies the teachings of the Pharisees, of sin and of pride. And I think there's a verse that really captures, you know, the Old Testament and the New Testament and, you know, what we're celebrating Easter all together. And it's 1 Corinthians 5, 7. It says, get rid of the old yeast, so that you may be a new unleavened batch, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So it's through the sacrifice of Christ Jesus that we are free. We're free from the law. We're free from the law of sin and death. It says in John 1.29, you know, when John met Jesus, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. This is the true Passover Lamb. It's the Lamb not of this earth, you know, where they were making sacrifices you know, daily for their sins through just the lambs and the sheep and the animals. This is the Lamb of God. This is the true Lamb that is meant to be a sacrifice for all of our sins. That's why when Christ died upon the cross, in John 19, 30, he said, It is finished. Because that is the finish of the atoning sacrifice that was made by God. In Romans 8, 2, it says, Through the Spirit of Christ Jesus, we are set free from the law of sin and death. We are coming out of this law that says circumcision is the requirement to be saved. You know, we are liberated. We're coming out of slavery, out of idolatry. And so Paul passes on what is most important. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, starting from verse 3, for what I've received, I've passed on to you as of first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. So most important is Christ died and he resurrected. You know, this is the core to the gospel. And this is the core of what we're celebrating today, which is Easter. This resurrection was a historical event. You know, we know Jesus Christ. Jesus is a histor historical person. You know, historical documents, everyone agrees, you know, that Jesus was a person who lived, and when he died and resurrected, there are witnesses of that fact. Hundreds of people witnessed it. Different times, different places, different people, different genders. You know, this is something that happened. It's a fact. And it's the foundation our faith. And the sad thing is, is that most people that don't believe this, what is their alternative? You know, most people, they live in fear of death. They have no hope. You know, that is the end when they die. They cease to exist. You know, they face suffering and hardship and this earth, and then when they die, it's nothing. So all they do is they fear that moment. Yeah, I met a girl, um, I think it was about two years ago. She was visiting. Um, she, someone brought her here, actually, to our church to visit. She was from China, um, but she spoke English fluently, of course. But she was an atheist. And we had lunch together over here at Garden 5. And I was asking her about you know, death and what she thinks. And I asked her about the you know, purpose of life and things like that. But when I asked her about death, she said it was something that she didn't even want to think about because it scared her so much. You know, being faced with nothing. Because if there's nothing after this life, that means that there's no purpose. That means there's no justice. You know, all of the evil that people do, it goes unpunished, ultimately. And so she was afraid, you know. And what was the point of her existence? Anything that she did, it didn't have any eternal point. There's nothing extending past that point. And of course, this is true for all mankind. All mankind is under this law. And when it comes to death, there's great fear. But for us, it's different. We have a hope. 1 John 3, 8, the reason the Son of Man appeared was to destroy the work of the devil. And in Hebrews 2, 14 to 17, it says this. 
says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. It says, for surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. We are among Abraham's descendants because we're not circumcised physically, but spiritually. We are circumcised by the Holy Spirit, our hearts. So thus we are counted in Abraham's descendants. It continues to say in verse 17, For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. You see, our atonement, our, our, our price was paid to the law. And that price was paid through Christ Jesus. God's justice prevails. And that is God's justice. A price had to be paid. But because Christ paid it in our place, we have eternal life. And in this verse, you know, they question, you know, why do you keep putting the burden on people's backs in order to receive salvation? And why do you place upon them this yoke? You know, we cannot pay it through the law. God paid it for us through his justice and his mercy and through the cross. And through that, our blessing that we have is that we're made alive in Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says, If there is no resurrection of the dead, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of, are of all people the most pity. I think that's so true. If, if Jesus Christ didn't resurrect, we have no hope. Our faith is, is pointless. You know, we have no salvation for our sins. If Christ just died and that was it, he was just a good man, a good prophet, a good teacher, someone to be respected, but yet we're still stuck in our sins. We're still stuck in the law. And that is why if we have faith in something that is like that, we're so pitied because it is hopeless faith. But it continues in verse 20. It says, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through one man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be, will be made alive. That is our blessing. We're made alive in Christ. We have eternal life. It is the greatest blessing that we have received. And I read this once. What is the greatest gift that we've received? What is the, the day that changed your life forever? It's the, death that, it's the day that we became a child of God. You know, that is the greatest day. The day we received Christ. And how are we made alive in Christ? It says that we are purified by faith. In verse 9 it says, He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. We are purified by faith. You know, you cannot say purified by faith and the law. <laughs> and it doesn't go that way. It says we're purified by faith. It is by faith, and actually by grace through faith, that we are purified. We are made righteous. Not by works. Period. Both in the past and now. You know, in the Old Testament and now, we are saved by faith. You know, on this side of the cross, we're looking back towards what Jesus Christ did. And on the other side, in the Old Testament, they were always looking forward to the work of Christ on the cross. So if you look at how people were saved during that time, and remember, a lot of the Old Testament, it's even before the time of the law, before the time of Moses. 
a lot of the, the patriarchs and a lot of the people of Israel. And it says in e Hebrews 11 what the key is. It says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, it continues, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. It says, by faith, Abel brought God a better offspring than Cain did. By faith, Enoch. By faith, Noah. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Jacob. By faith, Joseph. By faith, Moses. You know, by faith, all the people that passed through the Red Sea. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell. You know, by faith, you know, he says, what, what can I say more? You know, telling them about Gideon, Barak, Samson, you know, David, Samuel, the prophets. It is always by faith. Even in the Old Testament, it's by faith. That was the key to salvation. And in 39, it's the key. In verse 39, it says this. These were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, that, not, that only together with us would they be made perfect. They, along with us, Together we are made perfect through the blessing of Christ Jesus. It is the same on this side of the cross and that side. It is by faith we are saved. And once again, you know, don't be deceived by the yeast of the Pharisees. It is by faith. And it is through faith that God ultimately receives all the glory. And we reserve none for ourselves because it's not about us in any way. Nothing that we earn. Simply by faith and receiving God's grace that God receives all the work. And this happens through God working, effectively working salvation into us. God is the one that changes us, and it's through God's word and the Holy Spirit that he works. We are purified and refined in Christ by faith. And that is that God may receive all the glory. And in Ze Zechariah 13:9 it says, And I will bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. We are God's possession. In today's passage, in verse 11, it says, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved. It is always through grace. And it says, so what is the sign of salvation? Then? You know, this is what they, the Pharisees were putting on them, these Pharisee Christians. They're saying there's a condition for salvation. You've got to be circumcised. But what, is, what does Peter say is the sign? It says the gift of the Holy Spirit is only given to those that are saved. This is the sign. In today's passage, verse 8, it says, God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. It's all through the Holy Spirit. That's a sign. So then what is the significance of the circumcision? Now, this was a sign of the covenant, of God's promise. It was a signature on the contract God made with us to know and remember we are his. Now, another sign of the covenant is the rainbow. It's written in the heavens. It's a contract made to know and remember his promise. So what is the new sign? It is a seal that is guaranteeing our inheritance. And even in Deuteronomy 30, it says, The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts, and your descendants' hearts. And in Romans 2, 29, it says, The circumcision is a circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by the written code. You know, this is the circumcision that we received in the Holy Spirit. That is why when we're saved, it is through our confession and faith in our heart. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says that it is by your hearts that you believe and are saved. Because it's through your hearts that you're justified. And that justification takes place through, ultimately, God working the Holy Spirit in you. And it is God who truly knows your heart. Your actions do not control your heart. A lot of us think if we follow this law, if we do this thing, it'll control us. But it's the other way around. It's our heart that controls your actions. So you've got to ask yourself, where is your heart? Is your heart in the world, or is your heart rooted in Christ? Have faith in Christ, believe in your heart, and out of that, your actions change. Um, in closing, um, you 
know, we, as, as Pastor Dave shared as well, you know, this week throughout the news, we heard about this ferry boat tragedy that took place. Um, and this is truly a tragic event. And even this morning, I was reading the news, um, and it said that you know, there's still at least 256 people missing. And the sad thing is, is they said that, you know, the, the rescue operation could take at least, you know, weeks. And they say up to one to two months for this rescue operation to take place. And I think, if, if anything, you know, this, this tragedy, it reminds us about the reality of death. For us, it can come at any time. We don't know what that day, you know, is tomorrow or a week from now. We don't know when death is going to come. You know, only God knows. And for most people, there is no hope. But there is one hope that we have. Our hope is in the resurrected Christ. Because if Christ resurrected, that means that we too will resurrect. And so when faced with death, when faced with tragedy, you know, when our when our fellow remnants when their lives you know, are coming to an end, we are different from the rest of the world. We are ultimately <clears throat> completely different. Because we no longer need to fear death. Death isn't something to be feared by us. For us, it is simply a door to paradise. It's a door to meet our Father in heaven. You know, that's what death is to us. So I want to close um, just with one verse. It's 1 Corinthians 15, 55 to 56. It says, Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We have victory in Christ. Because he resurrected, we too will resurrect. He has conquered the grave, and we too have received that blessing in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Um, let's pray as our praise team comes up. And today is the day of Easter. And we're celebrating the death and resurrection of Christ. And it is a day to celebrate. Because the price was paid, and we have victory that we share in. Victory over death itself. So let's celebrate this day and let's pray together.